It's a pleasure to be here. So, I'm here to speak about on-chain payments and why they so far haven't really taken off. I don't know whether you remember the days of kind of Bitcoin being hailed peer-to-peer -peer cash. And how many people do you actually know who pay for crypto regularly? Okay, a couple of people, diehards in the back. <laughs> I'm happy you're here. Um, we kind of want to open this up for everyone else too. Fantastic. So, what's kind of, what's been holding payments on-chain back? There's actually a surprising number of uh, challenges. First one, scalability, right? So, if you look, and this is a little bit temperamental here. You know what, whatever. Scalability is a big problem. So, basically, if you look at Ethereum, there's currently um, a million and some um, transactions per day, 1.25, depending on what exactly they are. Um, and th there's nothing on the roadmap to substantially change that in the next three years. So, if you look at kind of what we can actually do with this, um, I did some back over the envelope maths. And uh, in Ethereum circles, this meme actually made the rounds um, a few months back, uh, basically uh, telling the Bitcoin crowd that Bitcoin can't scale even enough to kind of have everyone open a lightning channel upon birth and close it again 80 years later. But to be honest, Ethereum's not actually any better. So scalability has its limits. Um, um, for that, we now have layer twos and layer threes, like uh, Philip just talked about. Um, but even on these, the um, fees that the transactions cost, they rise in lockstep with fees on um, layer one, okay? So basically, fees go up on layer one, fees go up on layer two. So there's EIP 4844 on the roadmap, protodank sharding, it'll, um, it'll uh, uh, give us 10x more space, but basically if Ethereum is going to become like the global settlement layer that everyone kind of in the space at least hopes that it will become, and I think it can become, that's nowhere near enough. So, okay. Um, ENS names. Who here knows what an ENS name is? Okay, yeah, basically it's a name, it's basically it's a way to identify a name with an address, and people can just send um, to yourname.eth and it will arrive in your wallet. And registering these on chain would take two years for just, you know, uh, a couple of hundred million people. Um, so there's like every tenth person on earth, and Ethereum wouldn't do anything else in, this, in the meanwhile. Um, example two. Um, say instead of registering ENS names, you now um, let uh, it, it, let um, uh, let the stock market settle on Ethereum, right? And basically, it's totally 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 true. So most um, transactions would happen on layer two, and there would only be a few settlement transactions on layer one. But even those would be super. Uh, super constrained. So basically there's 45,000 publicly listed companies, um, so you would actually have 30 trans less than 30, 30 transfers per stock on Ethereum mainnet, so that wouldn't even be enough to settle between different L2s and, you know, large brokers. So the next problem is volatility, right? So first, we can't scale enough, so that means that um, uh, that transactions are just too expensive. Second is volatility, right? So basically, you try to pay someone, they say, okay, I'd like, you know, point zero 0.01 of a Bitcoin for this, and then the next day it's not no longer point zero 0.01, it's point zero 0.012, okay? So for that, we invented stable coins. You guys know stable coins. Um, the problem with stable coins is that historically, many of these have not actually been terribly stable. And a lot of people actually have been burned by them, um, which means they're now under a lot of regulatory scrutiny. So stablecoins, also somewhat difficult topic in the space. Okay, next topic is self-custody. Um, so basically, how many of you have ever, how many of you have ever started a wallet, like downloaded a wallet and fantastic. So you guys know like the flow with these are your 12 words, never lose them. So put them in as many places as possible, but also never show them to anyone because otherwise all your funds are gone, okay? 
So obviously, this is a terrible user experience, and that's not something that we can roll out to the next several hundred million people. Okay? So, okay, so I'll just go on without sites. <clears throat> so, the, you kind of, so basically, there's many reasons why payments so far haven't happened on chain. Okay, so one is tr transaction fees. So basically, you, you can't uh, you can't uh, uh, spend like a dollar or even you know a couple of cents on every transaction that you make if it's if you if you're going to use it for chewing gum and coffee, right? Um, second is um, the, the the way that wallets currently work, right? So you kind of you have to save your um, your seed phrase um, and you have to store it in a super um, uh, in a super safe place, but you can't ever show anyone. So, and the thing is, there's also not that big of a need, right? Because payments, we know payments, payments work. You all have like credit cards in your pockets. They work terrifically. For you, basically, what's there to make better, right? So, I'm skipping over slides again. This is not the case for merchants, actually. So merchants, depending on which card you use, they pay between 2 and 4% on your purchase. And this kind of comes out of their profit. So merchants are not hugely excited about the Visa MasterCard space, um, but they kind of they have to offer them because kind of making, um, making a payment um, and only receiving 98% um, is better than kind of not making the sale at all. So... How can we fix this? Um, there is easy on-ramping, okay? So, how many of you have on-ramped into um, the Ethereum or Bitcoin space? Okay, how many of you have gone via centralized exchanges? Was it a pain? Okay, pe 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 people are patient. So, um, yeah, you can on-ramp via centralized exchanges. The best in class is actually a project called Monarium. Mo Monarium allows you to kind of um, give an IBAN to your wallet and send funds to that, um, to that IBAN and, your, uh, and uh, the funds will magically show up in your wallet on-chain. Same for the other way around. So you have to time your picture well, otherwise you'll just you know, photograph a black screen. So, um, so otherwise, uh, so basically, if you, uh, if you want to do a separate transaction from your wallet, you now can, okay? There's no fees, so you have to go through very light KYC, um, and then you can give your wallet an IBAN. Secondly, last year was the year of self-custody. Why? You guys remember FTX, Celsius, you know, the entire Voyager implosion. Um, all of those were kind of trusted entities, and as Philip said in the last talk, trust in this, uh, in this uh, ecosystem is a dirty word, right? So if you look at um, how many Bitcoins actually went into self-custody from exchanges after these meltdowns, it was um, 15 million Bitcoins. So yeah, it's uh, crazy. And we think this is gonna come to payments next. So this is a project that we've been working on for a while. It's called Gnosis Pay. What it actually lets you do is it lets you connect a Visa card um, to, a, to an on-chain wallet. So basically you have your funds on-chain, you custody them on-chain, you have a Visa card connected to it, and you tab your Visa anywhere that accepts Visa, and these funds will be taken directly out of your self-custodial wallet, which is completely different to how all the other crypto credit cards currently work. Currently, they're kind of like preloaded. So you send funds to Binance or crypto.com, and then kind of they have, um, they have a spreadsheet where they, they, uh, they have an entry of how much you still have in that card to spend. Here, it's literally, uh, literally um, connected to your self-custodial wallet. Um, and uh, it's gonna, I'm leaking alpha here, so um, this will come out week after next at ECC. Um, but if you're sneaky and go to the website, gnosispay.com, you can already sign up for the wait list and uh, it will be available for people in Europe at no fees um, from September. Okay, so. 
Thank you so much for coming to this talk. So, so, sorry about the slight technical difficulties, you know. Hello. Uh, so are the fees? When a person passes the visa, what are the fees? Um, so the fees, so basically there's um, two different kinds of fees. So basically on the crypto side, there's no fees. On the visa fee, on the visa card, so basically it goes through the regular visa payment stack. So basically you, the merchant pays the regular fees that, it would, that they would pay with any other visa credit card. But that's basically on the visa side. There are no additional fees on the crypto side. It's a very insightful question because a lot of these crypto, crypto credit card cards actually have outrageous fees. So you pay like 5% or something on all purchases and this is not the case here. So basically for the user, zero fees. You have to pay once um, to get the card. It'll be 30 euros um, and then you, you can use it forever for free. <laughs>